praise be to God. Well, if you've been with us, you know that we're studying out of the book of Galatians. And uh, this is not the first time we've looked at Galatians. We're just look at it, looking at it from different angles. And it's been a while here. We've been in chapters 1 and 2 for a while. Because 1 and 2 talk about these things of, of faith and, and grace and so forth. Uh, and we, we want to continue on. The, what's happening in, in the church in Galatia is that these people had come from a background of, of uh, uh, hedonistic and, and pagan religions. And then uh, there were some Jewish people there. And all of these different types of uh, 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 tendencies or these different types of teachings were, were, folk, were coming after them and, as these new Christians. And we talked last week about the types of, of uh, philosophies, the types of faiths that were interrupting the, the gospel of Christ. And we, we mentioned last night the Gnostics were the people who think that it's what you know in your head. You know, it, the, more, the more degrees you have, the closer you are to heaven. You know, the more understanding you have of science and the more understanding you have of philosophy, uh, then that's, that's what makes you righteous before God. That God looks upon you and those with more PhDs get greater honor in heaven. That's the Gnostics. The, the Nicolaitans were people who decided that the spirit was separate from the body and instead of us being, you know, people said, well, I don't understand the Trinity and I just want to take a side step here real quick. That you and I are, are created in the image of God. What does that mean? If I were to stand some of you up here with me on the platform, you would recognize that we, none of us are exactly the same. Some of us are bigger, some are smaller, some are male, some are female. You know, we have, we have different, this are different pictures of ourselves here. But we are all created in the image of God. So what does that mean? We are created as triune beings, every one of us. We are created as a body. We are created as a soul, which is our personality. And we're created as a spirit, that part of us that came, that, that God breathed into us the breath of life and we are eternal. And so we are a triune being. And God is that triune being, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Anyway, the, the Nicolaitans said, well, because the body is what you see and what you get your, you know, your pleasures from. That is separate from the spirit, which is eternal. And so it doesn't make any difference what you do with the body as long as you keep Jesus in your thoughts. And, so, and that's one of the religions that uh, Jesus said in the book of Revelation. I hate that. I really hate that idea because it is what, what is going on inside of us is supposed to be be shown on the outside in the way that we conduct ourselves. We're going to look at that later. There were the Hellenists. The Hellenists were those people who, who just were philosophers. They liked to philosophize about everything. You know, I, I, I think, therefore I am, you know, and you're all figments of my imagination type of thing, you know. Uh, they were, the Hellenists were people who were just philosophers, and they liked to focus on philosophy. And then the Judaizers were those that came out of Judaism and they felt like everybody needed to keep the law and all of the all of the rituals of Judaism if they wanted to become a Christian. Paul was Paul was dealing with those things in this this place called Galatia, and he tells them. He starts out in chapter three. And he says, "You stupid people, of Galatia, who put uh, you under an evil spell? Wasn't Christ crucified for you? And that was and that was explained to you. Let me ask you something." Did you get saved because you kept all of the rules or did you get saved because Jesus died on the cross for you? If, he said if, if you could have kept all the rules, then Jesus would not have had to die. You know, there are some people out there, you know, I asked them, I said, well, if, if, if Christ came back today or if, if you were to pass away, if you knew that you were going to you were pass, gonna pass away today, do you know that you would go to heaven? And many people say, well, I, I hope so because I, I'm trying to do good. I, I'm trying to do more good than I do wrong. Uh, I, I, uh, I, hope, I hope I will. The, the problem with that kind of thinking is that we, we're putting all of our faith in us. I'm putting all that faith in me. Am I able to live a life that is going to please God, that is going to make Him want to take me into His kingdom? And the Bible is very clear on that subject. It says, There is none that doeth good, no, not one. For all have sinned and gone astray. 
Every single one of us. I, I remember speaking with someone not too terribly long ago of a, a different kind of thinking in the Christian faith who was saying, well, all men are good, basically. We're all good. If you just left us alone, we'd all figure out how to do good. And the Bible says that, no, we're all evil. And if, you, if without Jesus Christ, you're leaving us alone, we'll figure out how to be evil. And you look at humanity that way, you don't have to look very long at a little baby. I just had, by the way, had a, a brand new great-granddaughter born last week. In fact, she's just one week old yesterday. And I can guarantee you this one thing, that it won't be very long till she is acting selfishly and crying for her own way and not caring about how anybody around her feels. Because that comes naturally to us. That's part of the human nature. It's part of the fallen nature of mankind. We have to learn how to, how to do things right. We don't have to learn how to do things wrong. That is who we are. That's, that's part of the fallen nature. And so we have this, uh, and, and you know, Little Valley, that's her name, Little Valley. I, I, you know, I, I know that she's just going to be the perfect angel and never do anything wrong. That's because she's my, my great-granddaughter. That's the way she doesn't have a, a chance of, of being wrong or doing anything wrong because uh, she comes from good stock, right? Well, that all depends. If you talk to people who know me very well, they know that that good stock very often makes mistakes and does things that are wrong. Because that's the kind of people we are. So Paul says to the Galatians, don't be stupid. You know, you didn't, you didn't win God's favor by doing good things. You won God's favor simply because Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and you have accepted what Jesus did as, the, as your path to salvation. And he goes on and, and he talks to them about those things. He talks to them about about the law and, and what happened with Abraham. And, and you know, Abraham was, Abraham was counted as righteous before God when he was still a Gentile. Abraham wasn't a Jew. He was a Gentile. There were no Jews at that time. And, and Abraham came from a family that were idol worshipers. How do I know that? Because when Abraham sent his servant to get uh, a, a wife for his son Isaac, and and when Isaac sent his, you know, went to, uh, sent or Jacob went to get a, a wife, you know, Jacob is Isaac's son went to get a wife. They were going back to their families where they had come from in Canaan, and they had they were still idol worshippers back there. Remember the story how Rachel came out of uh, came out, and she had stolen her father's idols from his house. So the thing is, the, the, this righteousness didn't come because Abraham had been doing so many wonderful things and keeping the law. It didn't work that way. This is what Paul's talking about in, in Galatians. He said Abraham hadn't kept the law. Well, the law wasn't even given until 430 years later at the top of Mount Sinai when Moses went up there and God spoke to him and said, Now Moses, let me tell you what the rules of this family are going to be. You know, we're all one family. He, just, he said, I'm going to be a father to, the, to you. I'll be your God. You'll be my children. You'll be my, my people. But there's certain rules that you need to keep. Now, one of those rules was given way back with Abraham, and that was the, the rule of circumcision, which says, if you want to be part of the blessing of Abraham as a male, you needed to have me circumcised. So that was the one thing. The thing is this. That happened before the law. Abraham did that as an agreement with God. And the promise to Abraham was that God would give him all the land that he could see there and that he would be the father of a great nation and that he would, or a father of nations, in fact, and that they would outnumber the sands of the sea, which is you know, a, a, uh, an illustration, not a, you know, you sit down and count. It's, it's, not, gonna, it's not like you can say, okay, well, there's th this number of these and this number of those. It's an illustration. So we have, that, that is, that's the promise of, that was given to Abraham. And so when we talk about the Abrahamic covenant, that is what we're talking about. So when we talk about the Abrahamic covenant, that is what we come, we're talking about. But then we have the covenant that was given to the Israelites, which was the law that came along 430 years after Abraham, and, and that was 
telling the people, this, are the, this is the rules of our household. I, I use this illustration that in my home, we have children that are born in our, in our home, my wife and I. And they know the rules of the household. There are certain things you can do, certain things you don't do. Now, we've had people come into our home, children come into our home, that have be, be, been our, uh, our guardian, or we were guardians of those children in our lives. And as they came in, they needed to know that these are the rules of our household. And, and I wish that you know, they could say, I could say, well, they, every one of them agreed to it. Uh, that isn't the fact. And so, but when they, when they don't want to keep the rules of the household, well, then they can't be in the household. So God gave these rules to the Israelites, and He said, Here, here's the rules of our household, and you don't have to keep them if you don't want, but if you don't keep them, you're going to be put out of the camp, and you can't be considered an Israelite. That's the way it was. So then later on, Jesus came because so many people were disobeying the rules and breaking the rules, but they really wanted to be part of the household. They didn't want to, they didn't want to be put out. They didn't want to be estranged from God, but they were having a difficult time keeping the rules. And Jesus came, was sent to this earth that He might be a, the, not a, the sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins for those people who did not were not able to keep the rules because the rules were so so straight, you know, uh, that it was it was almost impossible to keep. So God had given sacrifices for sin offerings and so forth. So when we broke the rules, you could have these sacrifices. But Jesus came as the sacrifice for all mankind. Now here's what happened during that time. You had all of these Israelites that were keeping the rules or trying to keep the rules and going through the, the ceremonies of the sacrifices and so forth according to, the, according to the rules that God had for His family. But all of us over here who were the Gentiles, we didn't have those rules and we were out there living just uh, willy-nilly doing what we wanted to do and, and there was really no way that we had to, to fix the problem that we had with our estrangement from God. And Jesus became not only the sacrifice for the Jews, but the sacrifice for the Gentiles as well. And so now our sins could be forgiven by the, the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ. So we become we can become part of that same group. Prior to that, if you wanted to be part of the family of Abraham, you had to be adopted in, you had to become Jewish, you had to make that willing, you know, make a willing transition from who you were to becoming Jewish. Now through Jesus Christ, we have this, given this opportunity that we can just believe on Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and re re receive uh, our forgiveness because of His blood. And God says, at that point, we become adopted into the family of Abraham. Wow. It's great. It's cool, you know. We, we didn't have to go through all the rituals and all, the, all of the, the sacrifices and everything. We came in when Jesus was there and He said, I'm it. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Come to the Father through Me. You can't come to the Father any other way. And so when we come through Jesus Christ, we are adopted into the family of Abraham, into the, into the nation of Israel. Now there were people there at this time who were saying, well, if you're going to consider yourself adopted into the family of Abraham and the nation of Israel, then you're going to have to abide by all the rules that God gave to the Israelites. And so we had this conflict in, the nation, in this uh, church in Galatia where you had some people that were there saying, hey, now wait a minute, you can't be a Christian, you can't follow Christ unless you, be, if, unless you become a Jew. You can't be a Christian unless you're Jewish. You can't, be a, you can't be a Christian unless you're going to follow all the rules. And Paul had to deal with that. And as we read earlier uh, in chapters 1 and 2, we know that Paul went back to Jerusalem after he had been ministering for three and a half years and being taught by the Holy Spirit what God wanted him to do with the Gentiles. He went back to, Israel, to Jerusalem and there he met with Peter and with James, who was the brother of Jesus, the half-brother of Jesus, and James had become kind of like the moderator for the, the uh, Jerusalem council. And because we'll see, we see from time to time that James was the one who made the last, had the, the final say in things. 
And then he went back out again and 14 years later came back and met with the entire council. And they sent him back out along with Barnabas and, and Titus and some others uh, to minister to the nations or the, the nations that were not Jewish in the world. While Peter focused on the Jewish people, Paul focused on those who were not Jewish. But wherever he went, there were Jews living because they had been dispersed during the time of the Babylonian captivity. And again, they moved around during the time of the Roman, the Roman era. And so they, he found them everywhere. And wherever he went, there were these people who were saying, no, you can't be a Christian unless you become a Jew. And Paul's dealing with that when he talks to the Galatians. He says, wait a minute. Did you receive the presence of the Holy Spirit because, as we go back to Acts chapter 2, Peter spoke to the church, to the people in, in Jerusalem, and he said, if you repent and are baptized in the name of Jesus, you know, accept Christ, repent and be baptized in His name, you shall receive the Holy Spirit. So Paul speaks to these people, and he says, you know, uh, did you get the Holy Spirit because you were doing some great works? I mean, did you have to go out there and, and do, you know, do some kind of spiritual gymnastics? Did you have to you know, win so many, so many souls to the Lord before you could get the, have the Holy Spirit working in you? He said, no. You received the Holy Spirit because you, uh, you put yourself under the blood of Christ and made Him the ruler of your life. And so the Holy Spirit was, was given to you. So why is it now that you think that you have to go back and start doing the works that, that were required before Jesus came in order to keep your righteousness? You don't have to do that. He says, I don't know who these people are who are trying to drag you back into that kind of lifestyle. He says, but I wish that you know, they were... Well, he says some pretty crude things. You know, he says, they want all of you to be circumcised. He says, I just wish that they would be completely castrated. You know, that was, that was his feelings on this thing. So, which leaves us with this, this question. Okay, what is it I really need? How is it I really need to live? What is it I really need to do as a Christian? What is it that God expects of me? If I'm adopted into the family of Abraham, but I don't have to keep all of those rules, what is it that is expected of me? And Paul just clearly says, listen, you are given, and we've talked about this before, I'm going to keep on talking about it, you are given two commands. One of them is love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. The other is love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. You do those two, he says, in those two, all of the prophets and the law are wrapped up. You go, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That, that, that's just kind of glossing over things. Yeah, it is. So let me put it on a real natural, real you know, basis where we can all understand. When I was growing up, my, my parents' home, they had some rules in their home. And there were certain things that I was allowed to do, certain things I was not allowed to do, some things I was told never to do. When I was away from mom and dad, I have to admit, there were some things I did which I knew they would be displeased with. Now, I didn't want them to know I was doing some of those things. Because, one thing, not because I was afraid that somehow they were going to you know, lob off my head or something, you know, or, you know, tie me up and put me in a prison. That isn't why I didn't want to do them. I didn't want to do those things because I had a love for my parents and I did not want to hurt them or break their hearts. I remember one time I told my mother a lie. The one time, one of the times I got caught. But I told my, my mother a lie. And, and she took me aside and she, and she simply said to me this. She said, she, she had a switch in her hand, and I thought, oh man, I'm going to get a spanking. And she took the switch and handed it to me, and she says, here, beat me with this. I said, I can't do that. She said, beat me with it. You might as well. You couldn't hurt me any more by whipping me with that switch than you could by lying to me. See, she knew that the relationship 
that we had, a love relationship that we had as, as parent and child was stronger than the relationship we would have had as disciplinarian or punisher and offender. And that stuck with me all my life. And to the point where I must say that I hate lies. I hate them. You know, you can, you can rob from me. But if I asked you if you stole something, you might as well say yes. Because if you say no and I find out that you did, that's a worse offense to me. Because it made such an offense, it made such a, a, a mark on my life. So when I was with my mom and dad, there were things I didn't do that when I was not with mom and dad, that I did kind of on the sly, hoping that they wouldn't find out. As a Christian, as, 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 as pagans, as people who didn't know anything about the Lord, we went about doing things that were contrary to the will of God. I didn't keep the rules of the household because I was afraid that mom and dad were going to, to do something terrible to me if I broke them. But I kept the rules because I loved them and didn't want to hurt them. And we do the same thing as Christians. We keep the rules of God because we love Him and we do not want to offend Him or hurt Him in any way. Because of the love that we have for Him. Because we love Him with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And He is with us all the time. When we forget that He is with us, sometimes we act like we did when we were children and we were away from mom and dad. We do things that we think, you know, well, I know that they wouldn't want me to do this, but, you know, they don't know, and so I can kind of go ahead and do it anyway. But we forget that God is with us all the time, and there are some times that we do some things that we think, well, you know, God's, I'm not in church right now. I'm not amongst the church people right now. So, uh, you know, I can get away with this. No, we can't. And the thing is this, our love for God should keep us doing the things that God has set before us. Now you go, well, what about all that law? Let me tell you about that law. The law is simply this, God saying, if I had a perfect child, this is the way they would live. End of law. Now, did God change His mind about what the perfect child was going to be like? No. His mind is still there. He says, this is the way the perfect child would live. Now, the Ten Commandments are simply, you know, the like, like titles over the chapters of law that he gave. So we read the, we read the, the chap titles of the chapters and think, well, that's all the law. And it is, as long as we understand what the, the rest of the chapter is all about. But the bottom line of all of this is that God says, I love you, and I love that guy that lives across the street, and the guy that lives next door to you, the guy that's sitting in front of you in the church pew, the guy that, the guy that you work with, the guy that is your boss, the guy that is under your authority. I love them, and I want you to treat them as my child would treat them. I want you to treat them with my love. So the second commandment is love your neighbor as you love yourself. And, and God says, okay, here's, how you, here's what you do. If you really love me, then you're going to love that other person. And you're going to treat them the way that I would, you want me to treat you. They're going to, you're going to treat them with my love. And so we do. Now here's where we get off on that, where we get off track, is that sometimes our thoughts, Thoughts go back to personal things. When I was growing up in my household, I knew my mom and dad loved me. I loved my brothers and sisters, and I loved my mom and dad, and we, we had a happy household. Praise God, we had a happy household. It wasn't like a lot of households today. But sometimes, I would get the feeling like I deserved better. Not that I deserved a better family, but I deserved for my family to treat me better. And then when it didn't happen, because, you know, I was being in my own thoughts, in my own mind, I was not considering them in what I wanted. I was just considering me in what I wanted. 
and it wasn't taken into consideration what they would have to do in order to satisfy my longings. And I would develop an attitude. And so sometimes as Christians, we do that as well. See, we are told in Scripture that whatsoever things we ask in the name of Jesus, now that, that phrase, in the name of Jesus, does not mean I am using the name Jesus as the key to open the door to blessing. What it means is, it is in the character of Jesus. Whatever I ask in the character of Jesus, in other words, what Jesus would be ask, asking at that point, were He doing the one who is doing the praying at that moment? It shall be done. And so I've, I've had people go to me, well, you know, I've, I've done this and this and this. I've memorized this verse and this verse and this verse. I've prayed about this and it's not happening. What's going on? See, Here's, the, here's the, the, the bottom line of all of this is that my mom and my dad worked hard to make our family a family. And when it came right down to it, mom and dad had the final word in what was good for the family. They, they went out and they worked jobs. They brought in the paychecks. It was not my decision as to how the, pay got, the paycheck got spent. It was theirs. I, and, and sometimes... Their decision was that we're going to buy things for your sisters or we're going to do something for your brother or we're going to do something for the entire family and not necessarily for you personally. Because they loved the entire family. And they had, they had a purpose and a plan for the family. My Father in Heaven loves all of us the same and He has a purpose and a plan for the entirety of His family. So when I pray and I ask for something, when I'm asking in, out, of, out of my own desires and out of my own will, and I'm not taking into consideration anything else, I'm not saying to, to God, God, you know, I have this issue in my life, and I want to know, did you put it here? And if you put it here, could, could you help me just to accept it so that you can have your way here and work it out so that others will be blessed by it? Or... Father, uh, this, I got this thing in my life. Can you tell me how I got here so that if I've done something wrong, I can, I can go back and I can repent and get rid of this thing? Or is this an attack from the enemy? Or is this just the way the world is, you know? I walk outside and it's cold. That's not, a, that's not an attack from the enemy. It's just cold. I walk outside and the sun's beating down on me. That's not an attack from the enemy. It's just the sun. It's the way things are. We get old. We get feeble, more feeble than we were when we were young. And we, and we ask God for things and we don't always get them. Well, yeah, but see, I heard that minister over there say, you know, if, whatever you, you just ask, you just command it to be done. You can, you know, I have people say, well, you know, I've had, I've had this, this sickness and I've been asking God to heal me and I'm commanding it to go. I'm commanding it to leave right now. And I'm going, wait a minute. Did you ask God about it first? Did you ask God? Or are you just kind of in your own will, on your own understanding, following some kind of a ritual without asking God? But God always heals, right? No. And I'm, I'm going to share some things with you. In Galatians chapter 4, Paul says this, verse 13, You know that the first time I brought, I brought you the good news, I was sick. And even though my illness was difficult for you, you didn't despise or reject me. Instead, you welcomed me as if I were God Himself, or the messenger of God. So now what's happened to your positive attitude? You know, in fact, when I came to you, if you could have torn your own eyes out and given them to me, you would have. It's amazing how we get some of our teachings from Paul, but don't see that Paul... That they don't fit into what Paul said. In 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23, it says, Paul speaking to Timothy who was having problems with his digestive system, he says, stop drinking the only water. Stop drinking only water. Instead, drink a little wine for your stomach's sake because you are frequently sick. Or in Philippians chapter 2, Starting in verse 25, he says, I feel that I must send Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier back to you. 
You sent him as your personal representative to help me in my need. He has been longing to see you all and is troubled because he, you heard that he was sick. Indeed, he was so sick that he almost died. Paul told the people in Corinth, he says, you're taking the Lord's Supper without understanding what it's like to be part of the body of Christ. You're not understanding the, what, the, what it means to be the body of Christ. You're not understanding, you're not, you're not holding in reverence the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross of Calvary and His resurrection. He says, for this reason, many of you are weak and sick and quite a number of you have even died. So when we think about what we think the Word of God says, maybe we should go back and find out exactly what the Word of God says. Because God doesn't contradict Himself. Now, people will contradict God, but God does not contradict Himself in the Word of God. We find people saying, Why well, I, I, I wish that you would, uh, you, you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Oh, that's a promise of God. It's not a promise of God. It's a verse, it's a verse that, Jesus, or that John said to a friend as a greeting. Then we can't take it as a promise of God. Here's, see, this is why, this is why here I, we, we call ourselves the church of the open Bible, not the church of the open ideas. We're the church of the open Bible. And so we open the Bible and find out exactly what it says. And when God gives us a, a word, He also gives us an example. And so it's always good for us to read all of it from Genesis to Revelation, all of it, and see how the things that we think God says were experienced by the people in the Bible. And not just listen to some guy because he wrote a book or because he has a TV broadcast and think that he knows everything because very often they don't, including me. I don't know everything, but at least I go to the Bible to find out what it says. So Paul's saying to these people, why is it that you're getting so tangled up on all this stuff? Why are you getting so confused about all of this stuff? Listen, you received the Holy Spirit because you know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, that His blood was the perfect sacrifice, and that your sins are washed away by the blood of Jesus. And you understand that Jesus rose again on the third day. And that is the, the example that He has set for you and for me, that when, we, when these bodies die, that God is going to give to us a new recreated body that is, that is incorruptible. And that we are going to rise to meet Him in the air and there to be with Him forever and ever. Jesus said He went away and prepared a place for us. And, that when he, and because He's preparing that place, He is coming back and He's going to take us to be there with Him. These are the things that we can hold fast to. We get so tangled up with the things that are on this earth that we just get so confused and we start to wonder, Need I do, do I have to do this more? Do I have to do that more? Oh, maybe I'm not pleasing God this way or maybe I've just pleased God that way. Instead of just saying, you know what? I, I know what God wants from me. He wants me to love Him. He wants me to love my neighbor. And He wants me to trust in Him. To rest in the Lord with all my heart and not lean on my own understanding. That in all hit my ways, acknowledge Him. And He'll make the path straight. But I listen to too many people who stand up and say, this is the way I, I got this new revelation from God. There, let me tell you something. God isn't changing one, one jot or one tittle of, the, of what He has already said, and He won't change it until the end. There is no new revelation. There is simply understanding of what has already been revealed. You're saying God doesn't prophes give prophecies? Yes, He does. He gives prophecies. But He, he is not a fortune teller. God's prophecies basically are, this is what my plans are, this is what, how you need to fit into them, and if you refuse to follow my plans, you're going to be expelled. If you, if you, if you follow my plans, you will be blessed. What do you mean expelled, Pastor? We went back over this in Matthew chapter 25, 
24, 25, 26, where Jesus talked in his parables about those who were obedient and those who were not. So we have these rules, these house rules. And the house rules basically are love God and love your neighbor. Jesus said in chapter 14 of the book of John, St. John, He says, If you love me, you're going to obey my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and He will give you another helper who will be with you forever. And that, you know, you're not going to lose the Holy Spirit. And people go, well, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, but you know, somehow I lost. No, you're not. He says He's going to be with you forever. He's never going to leave you nor forsake you. You might be blocking yourself to, from hearing Him, but He's there and He's going to constantly be dealing with you. That helper is the spirit of truth. The, word, the world cannot accept Him because it doesn't see Him or know Him. You know Him because He lives with you and will be in you. These are promises that you can keep. You can rely upon. I will not leave you all alone. I will come back to you in a little while. The world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Why? Because you're going to be going to heaven and the Holy Spirit's going to be revealing him, me to you. You will live because I live. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. But yet it's not I. It is Christ living in me. Whoever knows and obeys my commands... Whoever knows and obeys my commandments is the person who loves me. Can I say that again? Whoever knows and obeys my commandments is the person who loves me. Oh, I love you, Jesus. I love you. But you know, Lord, I, 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 love, I, I love my neighbor's wife. Oh, oh Lord, you know, I, I, love, I love to go out on Saturday nights and get drunk. Lord, you know, I, I, love, I love to just you know... That, that feeling that I get when I smoke pot or when I shoot up cocaine. You know, you know I, love, I love to just you know, spend my time. I know that I should be gathering together with the, with the believers, Lord, and, and worshiping you, but you know I just love the golf course. I love the ball field. Lord, you know that I love these things. He says, those who know, who know and obey my commandments is the person who loves me. Not just because you say you love him, but because you do love him. And when you do love him, you want to obey him. Those who love me will have my Father's love, and I too will love them and show myself to them. J Judas here says, what do you mean? <laughs> We're going to go on. Chapter, or verse 23. Jesus answered him, Those who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them, and we will go to them and make our, our home with them. The person who does not love me does not do what I say. I don't make up what you're, what you're hearing me say. What I say comes from the Father who sent me. I have told you this while I'm still with you. However, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and He will remind you of everything that I have ever told you. Now listen. Paul goes on in Galatians and he talks about how a child is raised and he is taught by the servants. He, he is like a servant being brought up and taught by servants, by teachers, until he gets to be mature and he becomes old enough that he can take over, take over his father's estate. And he calls, he says, we are like that in the kingdom of God. We are like, we're like children. We're learning. The Holy Spirit is sent to us to teach us the things of the household of God. We don't know them. Oh, we don't, we're learning those things, folks. We're learning those things. There's not one of us out there that's got it all together. If we had it all together, God wouldn't, God would say, well, you know, uh, I got another Jesus here. Let's crucify him. No, uh, let's, we, you know, we don't have it all together. We're learning. And, and as long as we are willing to learn, as long as we are willing to allow God to change the way we think and the way we act, we renew our minds, as Paul said, so that we can prove the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As long as we are willing to be taught, we are useful. The moment we decide that we know it all and we're not willing to be taught, we become useless because God cannot correct the wrongs that we think. And believe me, we all have wrong thinking, including all of us. Right here, i got lots of wrong thinking. God needs to be correcting me from time to time. But we go back to the Word of God and we find out what that correction is. How, it's, how we're to be corrected and what God really wants. 
So the, the church in, in Galatia, he is saying, you know, this is the way you are, folks. You are, you, you have come into the kingdom. You've come into the family of God. You've been adopted into the family of Abraham by the blood of Jesus. The Holy Spirit has been given to you because you have made Jesus your Lord. And now you're you're wanting to make all of these extra rules and regulations and you think that you have to do this and do that. You know, I, gotta, got, you know, I have to give this amount of money. I have, to, I have to go out and witness to this many people throughout the day. I have, to, I have to give up this and I have to give up that. You don't have to do anything. Some people ask me, if I become a Christian, do I have to tithe? The answer to that is no. But you can't remain a Christian if you're going to rob God because then you become a thief and God says, no thief is going to inherit the kingdom. Well, what do you mean? Well, that's what he says. He says in Malachi, if you're not giving me what is mine, you're robbing me. He says, he says in, in Revelation, there's a place in the lake of fire for thieves. So where are we? You don't have to. Any more than a Jewish young man had to remain part of the, the family of Abraham. He could have gone off and become part of the world. And just gave up on all of the all of the rituals and, and the laws that God had given to Israel. He would have now just lived like the devil in the world, and, and he would have died without the blessings of Abraham. See, we have we have this word of God which we need to get into. And next time we're going to get together, we're going to talk about the difference between the works of the flesh and the works of the Spirit and what they mean. Because unless I have this love relationship with my Father and I don't want to hurt Him, I don't want to grieve Him because of my actions, I, I, want, to, I want to do what I'm supposed to do because I love Him, not because I'm afraid that He's somehow going to squash me or that somehow you know I'm going to get kicked into, you know, into hell because I made a mistake somewhere along the line. I get these people, well, what happens if right before you die, you, know, you live a good life and right before you die, you curse somebody out or something and then you die in a car accident. Are you going to go to hell? Hey, that is, that's a stupid question. I didn't, I'm not going to heaven because I didn't curse them out. Why would I go to hell? Because I did. The only way I'm going to go to heaven is because I've trusted in Jesus Christ. And yes, while I'm trusting in Jesus Christ, I make mistakes. Should I make mistakes? Is that, a, is that an open door for me just to go out and do what I want to do? Making the mistakes? Absolutely not. Because if I feel like that, that means I really don't love the Lord. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what I command. So we have this, it's, it, it's a, a relationship problem. When I was in my parents' household and I was with my parents, I kept, I, I didn't do anything that was going to hurt them or harm them or make them embarrassed about me. And now that I'm in my father's house and I am, you know, and he is with me continually, I don't want to do anything that's going to hurt him or, or, or frustrate him and, and make him upset with me. I just, want to, I just want to live my life to love him. Which means I have to live my life to love you because that's what makes him happy. Hallelujah. Father, you are so good. And there's so much that you just pour into us. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit who is constantly just telling us and helping us and strengthening us, changing us. I thank you, God, that you, you love us so much you're not going to leave us the way we are. I thank you, Lord God, that you love us so much you didn't leave us the way we used to be. I thank you, God, that we are constantly under your hand and, and you are continually, by your grace, making us better. I thank you, Father, because we want to express our love for you in a greater way. So, God, help us. Help us, O oh Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit to understand and have knowledge of your word and of Jesus Christ, our Savior. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And now may God's grace and peace be upon you. May the presence of the Holy Spirit just fill you up and flood you with joy. And when Jesus comes, may you look at Him with a big smile on your face knowing that it wasn't because you worked it out. It's because He worked it in to you. God bless you. Bye-bye.